Hey there, it's Paul Carruthers. How are you today? I'm with Sean Bice, my uh, my co-host of Off Track, our podcast for Moto America. I'm the communications manager for Moto America, and uh, Sean is my right hand man. Helps me with everything, um, obviously during the off season, and then uh, and then things really ramp up when uh, when the season starts, which we're starting to look down the. Uh, down the barrel of the season pointing at us and it'll seem like uh i bet it goes quickly it'll it, it will be in road atlanta tomorrow what do you think sean are we, are we ready to go or what i'm ready tomorrow i can't wait it's uh the weather the weather might be tough this weekend to race but i'd be ready for it if we could do it that's for sure yeah it's funny how um the off season kind of drags a little bit and then we get to this point and it just seems to me that, uh, you know, from looking at our social media and the comments from people, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm excited about this season. I think some big things are going to happen and I think we're going to see um, that big jump in our series this year. And it's, it, as far as popularity and fan attendance, and um, I know we're getting ready to announce our, our new TV package, which I think people will be excited about. So I think there's a lot of good stuff uh, coming down the pipeline in the next uh in the next week or two. And it was funny. I don't know if you, if you were paying attention. Well, I know you were, but um, we, it, with our little Twitter battle there with uh, one of the, <laughs> was... one, one, one of the English journalists, you know, he, he, uh, mouthed off a little bit on, uh, on Twitter and said that, you know, there, he put, he thinks their series is the best national superbike championship in the world. And of course I don't totally agree with that. And then <laughs> that whole thing sort of evolved into, well, let's have this match race series. Like they used to have, you know, in its heyday, you know, back when when Wayne did it with uh, with Kevin Schwantz. And as I pointed out, it wasn't much of a match back then because the Americans dominated. And I don't know, I, I, I have every confidence in the world that our top seven or eight guys could compete with uh, with their top seven or eight. But it sure would be fun. And then I saw Wayne tweeted on there today like, hey, the only way we can settle this thing is on the racetrack. So, Stuart, why don't you figure <laughs> out how to make it happen? So that kind of stirred the pot a little bit more, but it's kind of fun to see that people, I, I think something like that would just build so much excitement. And I think it'd be good for both series, but I don't know if it'll ever happen. There's all kinds of things involved, like, you know, different spec tire companies and stuff like that. But uh, man, it sure would be nice. It's funny too, because all afternoon I've been seeing these notifications pop up on my phone and I see like Alex Lowe's mentions, you know, puts a thumbs up and, that uh, Chavi Forez said something about it. It's like all all the riders are totally into it. So you know, yeah. and once Wayne once Wayne chimed in, I think everybody's all all gung ho on making it happen at this point. So well, I saw like uh, I Johnny Ray put a little thing on there. You know, the yeah, Johnny guy, Ray like yeah. raising his hand, like yeah, I want a piece of that. But yeah. um, you know, he's kind. He's he's. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, you know, I'm talking about our series versus their series. I'm not talking about. Americans versus the Brits, right? Right. You know they could they could start bringing in Cal Crutchlow and all and Johnny Ray and all this stuff and and I, that's not what I want. I just think the guys top guys in our series could kick their asses. The top guys <laughs> in their series, like I think we could do that. Like six out of seven days, we could kick their ass. You know, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully one day we'd get to we'd get to show that because I think it would be pretty cool. You but know, anyways, it's funny so, too. It, it's funny ahead. too. I was going to say because a lot of that it, they were taught. You know this. International Classic that happened uh, recently in your homeland of Australia on Phillip Island. Apparently, the format of those races is based on those old transatlantic uh, match races too. So that kind of put the thought in people's heads too. And then, and then this whole thing came out. So um, I think people are definitely have it in mind of of doing something like that. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm it's funny they all too. come up with their different ideas of what racetracks to go to. You know, like uh, right. And some of their some of their racetracks, I mean, it's like holy smokes. Um, that exactly. You know, it guys like guys like our guest today would be fine because it you know I think most of them would feel like a dirt track TT to them. So, um, what do you right. what do you got for me today before we introduce uh, before we introduce our guest? Do you have one of your silly stories, or are you laying low today, or what? Well, it's funny. I, I was going to lay low and I was also going to mention about this thing that was blowing up in the Twitterverse <laughs> once Wayne got going. So I'm glad you talked about that. So that was kind of my story today is that uh, maybe we can get that thing happening. I don't know why it always used to happen around Easter, but they used to always call it what the Easter transatlantic match races. And 
Heck, Kenny Roberts was involved in it. I know Wayne raced one year, and I think he broke his foot one year when he was there doing it. But uh, it was a big deal then, Freddie Spencer and all those guys. So, you know, you just think about some of our guys, including our, our guest that's going to be on here. I think I, I think uh, the, way, the way this guest is such a huge fan of Kentucky basketball, he understands – competition and, and what it's all about with rivalries. So I think he would enjoy going up against those Brits pretty well, for sure. So um, so that's that's really all I've got. I think, um, you know, if we had a if we had a uh, a competition in the match races that involves, you know, height of the individual racers, I think we've got that covered as well, because our guest today is um, I don't know that I've ever I'm, I, I've been around this game for a long time. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a taller road racer than than uh, than our guest. But um, obviously by now you've probably figured out our, our guest is Jake Lewis. The I, we can't call him a gentle giant because that's what we were calling. Uh, that's what we we called Hayden Gillum. So we'd have to come up with a di- different name for him. But he's definitely a uh, a tall fella. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about his 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 past years. This past year in 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 the Superbike Championship uh, on the Team M4 M Star eh, X Star Suzuki, uh, Jake finished sixth in the Superbike Championship, and he got on the podium once with a third place in our second race at Utah, uh, which would have been the highlight of his season. And I think he had a you know it, he's it, it was one of those seasons that like it was kind of quiet for him until he got on the podium. But if you look at the results, I mean, he's he's consistently that top five, six guy. Um, and again, he's not uh, he's not on a factory bike. He's on a he's on a team hammer bike, which is is probably as close as you can get without being on a factory bike. But as we all know, there's always some advantage to being on a factory bike. Now, Jake was on that factory team. He was a Yoshimura Suzuki rider until he suffered an injury um, riding that darn motocross. Um bad wrist hand injury um back in 2000 and i guess it was the off season between 2015 and 16. so six 2016 he missed most of the season and also had to watch tony elias take his superbike ride and, and do fairly well with it as we've seen but uh he, he i don't think he's I, I think he's been down a little bit but i mean he's pretty much an up upbeat kid so it didn't get him down too much uh, 2017, he was second in the two in the uh, Superstock 1000 class, and as I mentioned last year, was uh, was sixth in the Superbike Championship. He's coming back for another year of Superbike next year with the same team, uh, the X Star Suzuki team, and uh, let, let's bring Jake Lewis into the room and have a chat with him. Uh, Jake, how are you today? And I know you're in Kentucky. Is it is it freezing there? Is it is it doable? What what do we got going there? Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. You know, I've been listening to a couple of them, and you guys have been doing a, a great job. And uh, like you said, today it's, it's not too bad in Kentucky. It's uh, 60 degrees, but it's actually been raining all day. So this has definitely been one of the most warmer days we've had. You know, it's been so cold over the past month. I think last week, you know, it was 7 degrees as a high of one day. And uh, not a lot you can do outside, which is pretty uh, unfortunate. So I've just been doing a lot of stuff inside and i'm actually packing up my stuff and heading to uh texas this weekend so kind of looking forward to getting out of the weather and getting down there are we going to see you in california at all no i actually didn't come out to california this year you know usually i drive uh, the past three four years you know i drove out there and uh stayed with the hayden family the first two years and then last year stayed in oceanside around josh hayes's place but uh this year you know tried to s- save some money and stay back here and uh kind of wait until February to really kick things up and start going and um, heading down to, like I said, heading down to Texas this, this weekend and staying with Kyle Martin at M4 and uh, also uh, one of my dirt track mechanic, Travis Smith, to get my bike ready for Daytona and be ready for that flat track round. What do, hey, Jake, what do you, what, yeah, what do you, what do you think of that, that track, Jake? I mean, you know, we want to talk about road racing in Moto America, but I have to ask you about that layout. And you're a road racer, so what do you, what do you think? It's, it's kind of supermoto, wouldn't you say? I mean, everyone keeps saying it's like supermoto, but I mean, one pace straightaway, I wouldn't really consider it a supermoto race. You know, everyone's kind of freaking out. But <laughs> if you watch the TT back from last year, I mean, the front straightaway, you know, it gets grooved up and pretty much like an asphalt track. The only thing that I feel like will will be interesting is going down into, into turn one, you know, when you're braking on the asphalt, braking down into the dirt. But I mean, 
I mean, I'm not I'm not really scared or anything, and I I, I feel really good on the front break and should have won the thing there last year and uh, was pretty pretty bummed about not getting that done. So hopefully going back for some revenge this year. That's cool. Is that going to be your only one? Uh, you know, I might try to do a few of the TTs, uh, the dirt track. You know, I actually pay to do those on my own and don't really have any support. You know, I get a bike from Suzuki. And other than that, I pretty much pay for everything. You know, I paid for my suspension. Paid. You have to run a, a aftermarket clutch. So paid for that. Paid for all my entry fees. So if I can do well enough to make my money back and make a little bit, you know, I'll probably do a like three or four of the TTs and hit, hit the ones that I can. Is is M4 going to get involved at all? And, in, you know, last year, of course, Valentin raced in the 200. Uh, any talk of you guys, you racing in the 200 for M4 this year? I don't think it's going to happen. You know, last year, or actually in October, I actually did think it was going to happen. I went down there and uh, coached the Team Hammer School in October uh, at Daytona and did the race of champions and rode the 600 for the first time in four years. And, uh, was looking like it's going to happen, but, you know, with the signing of Bobby Fong and Sean Kelly, I think those two are uh, planning on doing the 200. I'm not 100% sure if that's confirmed or not, but uh, I think, you know, I'm pretty much just going to be focusing on the Superbike series and then also a couple of the dirt tracks that I do. Okay. Is there is there some... Is there some things that you can do differently for this year, the, a second year on the super bikes? I mean, is there is there things that you need to focus on a little different as far as your riding, or is there is there different things the team needs to do to step up to get you to that next level? I mean, is that something you're? I mean, that's obviously got to be your goal at this point. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, once the season ends, you pretty much have five, six months throughout the winter to prepare for uh, the, the upcoming season and. As it's looking like, you know, the Superbike class is going to be really stacked this year, and uh, I think the whole the whole team's working hard to, you know, make the best bike possible for me. And uh, with the electronic rules changing for our series, I feel like that's going to help our team out a huge amount because uh, we will be switching over t to some different electronics, which will uh, honestly, I feel, make a huge difference in our bike because, I mean, as you could see at Miller last year up in that elevation you know you don't you don't really use as many electronics as the most of the tracks down at sea level and uh, i had a really good ride out there because i didn't really have to focus on the bike wheeling and doing all the stuff that it usually does that i'm trying to manage throughout a race so uh i feel like that's going to help for sure and then you know i feel like just focusing on myself will will help a lot you know it's interesting jake uh, last year during the season i mean it you had an unbelievable number of consistent fifth place finishes. You were very consistent all year. You only had one DNF, I think, but crazy amount of fifths. You ended up sixth in the championship, but only one point out of fifth and right behind Garrett Gerloff, who is a factory rider. So, I mean, you were extremely consistent this year. And it's interesting to hear you say, you know, what you can do to kind of get to that uh, next level. But you're, you're right in the mix, though, for sure. You're always in the picture. It, it was a good year for you, I think. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, I always try to work on being consistent because you never want to be on the ground. You know, I didn't start off the, the season the best at Road Atlanta. I think I high side of my brains out the first weekend. You know, I got a little bit too excited in turn one because I was fastest in morning warm up in the rain and crashed the first turn. But uh, other than that, I stayed off the ground for the most part. And uh, like you said, had a ton of fifth places. And uh, that's always a little bit frustrating. You know, I was always in contention in the battle for fourth or sometimes even the podium spot so you know it'd be a real good thing if i could turn those fists into podium spots and try to be you know more up towards the the front of the pack mm. this, this year let's go back let's go back a little bit to I, I you probably get tired of talking about it but it is it obviously was a big thing in your career and that's getting hurt um when you're riding that motocross bike because obviously your career was skyrocketing you're on a factory Suzuki, uh, Yoshimura Suzuki team as, uh, as a super bike rider at a very young age. And you did well that first year in the championship. You finished fourth. Um, you had some podiums. And then, and then that injury happened. How, how long has it taken you to like actually get over that? I mean, not necessarily the physical part, but maybe the mental part or just, just catching up from that lost time and, that, and losing that ride. <laughs> well let's just say you know i'm honestly uh i mean if 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 i'm telling the truth i mean i'm still not over it, you know as 
as a young kid, that's what you kind of dream of. And Yoshimir Suzuki growing up, I mean, was the the team to be on and being on a factory Suzuki team. I signed, you know, I signed the contract when I was 18 years old. And uh, that was kind of like a dream come true for my family and myself. And uh, the first year, like you said, was was pretty good. I, you know, I had three, four, five podiums, I think it was, but it was a big learning year. You know, I had never rode a, a thousand growing up and kind of been in that stressful of an environment and had the pressure on me to do well. So that first year was definitely a building year and then was really looking forward to that second year with the team. But, you know, it was kind of a, a dumb error on my part because I'd been training in California, I think, for two, two and a half months and came back to Kentucky and was feeling really good. And it was the the night after I drove 30 hours, you know, and went to the motocross track and uh, broke my shoulder. And, you know, the recovery time took forever. So it's, you know, I can still remember that day to like, like it's, it's in the back of my head still to this day. So uh, it's not a good feeling, but you know, that's why I keep at it and try to, trying to get back to that spot. You know, they had a open spot this year and Josh got it. You know, I feel like he definitely deserved it because he had some phenomenal rides this past year. And uh, I think it'll be interesting, you know, this year because uh, he's, he's coming over to Suzuki and then me with the new electronics being on a Suzuki and the level of talent that's uh, in the class will, will be huge. But also, you know, a lot of people do ask me about my injury and uh, what it would be like today. And, you know, you never know because I feel like, you know, some of the reason Tony's over here is because I got hurt. So uh, a lot of, the people in the series and the Moto America can thank me for him being over here. <laughs> That's a good point. Did you do you have any lingering issues at all from that shoulder, or is it is it all good? I mean, do you have to do any kind of therapy still? Yeah, you know, actually, uh, this winter I've I've went back to doing a little bit of therapy because I didn't really realize it until I was you know lifting some weights this past off season is how much uh, range of motion I still kind of lack in that shoulder and. Uh, the past, you know, month, month and a half, I've really been working on getting all of that back because uh, it didn't really bother me. It, you know, it doesn't bother me at all on the bike or on the on the track or anything. It just kind of, you know, I don't really have an, as much flexibility and, you know, shooting a basketball, just doing stupid little stuff you don't even think about. Uh, I didn't notice it until a, a couple months ago. So, you know, it doesn't really affect me too much and no really issues or pain or anything like that. You know, Jake, I've got a story to- I, Jake, I got a story to tell you that I have never told you before. Um, it's not it's not very earth shaking or shattering in any way, but it was back when I was writing for Next Moto Champion, and I had talked to Earl Hayden, and I'm I'm name dropping there because I don't talk to Earl all that often, but I remember he told me about this rider that he had in Wira that he was working with, and he and he said it's Jake Lewis, and I it's the first time I'd heard the name, and he said you know I think he's going to be pretty good, and he said you know you might want to do a story on him, so I I did I, I wrote a profile of you at the time when you were I think you were just starting to get involved in AMA Pro and you know after that I didn't realize until I had worked a little bit with Garrett Gerloff that you and Garrett were pretty big rival rivals in Wira and here you are kind of rivals again and in, in well you were in you were in Super Sport and Daytona Sport Bike and here you are in Superbike again it's it's funny how you guys still kind of uh you know get together and are, are rivals and, and friends to this day but does that seem like a really long time ago that you were racing in Wira or does it seem like it was only yesterday yeah, no, that's a really funny story to me, just because it does feel like yesterday. Uh, and it's funny to look back on, you know, because me and Garrett are really good friends now. I think, you know, just because we're the same age and pretty much the two youngest ones in the Superbike class. But to look back on those days and, uh, you know, I think that was back in 2011. Me and him definitely weren't the best of <laughs> friends that year. And, uh, I mean, we hate, we honestly hated losing to each other because, you know, he was on a, pretty much a factory Yamaha with the with the weird days and i was on a yamaha sponsored by a pawn shop you know kicking his ass so uh he didn't like that too much uh but you know like you said we've uh we've been battling you know i think both 2013 and 2014 in the sport bike class uh, he, he did better than me one year and then the next year i did better than him and uh we had a few battles you know this past season in the super bike class he was a rookie in the class and I'd been on the thousand for, you know, a couple of years now. So I feel like this year, you know, it would definitely be more of a level playing field and really looking forward to it. You know, I feel like he's one of the guys that I compare myself to because, you know, we are the same age and 
we pretty much made the same steps throughout our whole career and uh, kind of gauge where, where I'm at based on based on him and mm-hmm. vice versa. That's cool. Okay, I got to ask you something. I saw I saw on your social media, I don't know, a week or two ago, that it was a photo of you um, with the, I think it, was, it must have been the big coon or something with the, the surfboard thing there as the trophy. But you, you were telling, you, you kind of got into this story where you, I'm going to let you tell it, but it, it sounds like your diet that day of qualifying <laughs> wasn't so good. So fill us in on that and, and give us a little background on on uh, one of the ways that you learned what to eat and what not to eat on race day. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty funny story. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't really get to tell the full story because it's kind of hard typing, uh, typing it all out. But as my first year pro, you know, all, all throughout my amateur career, I didn't really, I mean, di- literally didn't train a lick. I mean, I've pretty much rode motorcycles. You know, I had three acres at my house. I rode at least five out of seven days of the week just because, I mean, I love riding and didn't know anything about running and cycling and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, didn't really think and put into my brain, uh, that the pro races were longer than the amateur races. You know, I was used to the four, six lap sprint races, and then I would do a lot of endurance races when I was in Weira kind of growing up. But the second weekend that I was a pro, we raced at road Atlanta and, you know, road Atlanta is a little bit of a physical track and it was hot. And, uh, the team I was riding for at the time had a chef that morning and he cooked up a, a big breakfast, you know, and usually the riders don't eat, eat the same breakfast as what the crew does. But, you know, I just, I just kind of went for it cause I didn't know. And that, uh, had, had a lot of bacon. <laughs> uh, the guy got with me, uh, I mean, I don't know if it was pancakes or French toast, but you know, I pretty much made myself sick that morning <laughs> eating as much bre- breakfast as I could. And, uh, went out for qualifying and I think it was only like a 30 minute qualifying and my dad and my team told me to stay out there for the whole session you know just to get in laps and get up to speed and all that stuff and I pulled in with three minutes to go and I think I was sitting in either second or third and they were just like yelling at me like what's wrong and I was like my damn calves were cramping up so bad (laughs) just because I was like so dehydrated and uh, hurt from that (laughs) breakfast and uh, it wasn't a fun day for sure. (laughs) That's awesome. You mean those big calves actually cramped up? <laughs> yeah, that was honestly it was the one of the most painful uh, things that I've ever had. To have. <laughs> you know, wow. I was I think I was so dehydrated and eating like crap too because I didn't know. And uh, at the time, we had a fun mover, and my my whole family was there. You know, my mom, my sister, my dad. We were sitting at the track, and even that night, you know, after your body gets so dehydrated, going to sleep, I was even cramping up. So it wasn't the most pleasant thing and uh, definitely learned from that little experience. (laughs) That's amazing. You know, it's funny. I I used to love to see and hear or observe on Twitter when Roger would, uh, Roger Hayden would uh, show pictures of you sleeping on the way or, you know, when you guys room together and you with your laundry and, you know, what, uh, What's going on with Roger these days? Are you are you seeing him much at, at this point? You still hang out with him. You still ride bicycles. What's going on? Uh well, you know it's been so cold here, so I haven't really seen him a whole lot. But we, uh, you know, besides this past like month, month and a half, uh, he's I guess he's getting back. Maybe he's feeling bad. He's getting back into the health park, and uh, we we've meet up. We've met up like two or three times a week throughout the throughout the week and go play basketball. Me, him, and uh, Nick McFadden. So. That's been pretty fun. You know, we meet up for lunch and go out to play basketball. But other than that, I mean, I don't really know. Maybe he's just helping Dana with the with the cats and doing that kind of right. stuff. But I haven't really kept up with it, kept up with him too much, you know. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some of those uh those basketball videos and um, you know, you I I would expect you to dominate those two little guys, do you? Or or, or do they have the better outside shot or how does that work? Oh, come on, Paul. I mean, for sure I dominate those guys. But, you know, I do I do have to let them win a game or two occasionally uh, just so they'll keep coming back and playing how, with me. What is it? How does it work? Do you guys, do you guys play horse or do you play three on three? What do you, how do you, what do you do when you play? No, well, it's, yeah, it's just us three. So we play a game called 21. So, I mean, you pretty – I don't know if you not know much about basketball, mm-hmm. but if you hit a shot, you can pretty much go to the free throw line and hit – three free throws or if you miss one and get tipped you go back to zero so i mean it's a it's a fun little game we can play us three you know it's all individual and kind of against each other so 
you know, some of the games get a little bit heated because all three of us are pretty competitive. <laughs> That's great. That's pretty good. Do you still follow Kentucky? You still follow Kentucky basketball pretty uh, heavily too, right? Are you you still as big a fan? Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, especially just because my mom loves Kentucky basketball so much, and uh, you know, I didn't. I don't know if a lot of people know, but my mom is you know half American Indian, and we have a reservation in Kansas. So you know, a couple weeks, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, UK played Kansas, and uh, my aunt and uncle from Kansas came in. So that was really fun to to be able to experience that and our basketball team's uh, pretty good this year so it's exciting to watch I watched game. that game that was blue against blue Kansas against Kentucky I I could hardly <laughs> tell them which team was which for a while there so that was pretty good yeah yeah it was a divided house for sure you know they had all all their Kansas stuff and we had all had all of our uh, UK stuff on <laughs> so it was, it was a fun day so I, I've got to I got to tell you something I this time of year I go out in my garage and you know, my bikes are out there and I'm not riding them much, but you know, I can, I can sit there and I'll look at him or polish him or whatever. And my wife will come out and she go, what are you doing? And I'll go, I'm just, I'm sitting here looking at my motorcycle. I mean, I like, <laughs> I just like to look at motorcycles and I, I'm sure you're the same way. I'm sure Paul is. And, at, and on Moto America weekends, I spend a lot of time just like looking at the bike, staring at him. And Jake, I look at your, your bike versus like, uh, Tony's, or and now it'll be Heron's and it's it's the same bike but it really isn't it's quite different and I mean you guys you guys don't <laughs> have some of this stuff that the the factory team has and I understand that it's got to be there's a reason for that but you know talk to us about what that's like because you know obviously M4 and Team Hammer does an amazing job with their bikes and what they do but you know, it's it's different than the factory bikes, and you know, is that tell, talk talk to us about what that's like? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, if you look at our bikes from about a hundred yards away, they look the same. But uh, if you put them next to each other, they don't even look the they same don't. at all. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I mean, honestly, their bikes. Uh, I mean, I know it's really expensive, and they have a a ton of nice parts on it, and. Uh, being in the super bike class, obviously they do have a quite a bit different swing arm than than our bike does, and even their body work. You know, they spend a lot of uh, effort and money on the body work that they have to make the you know aer aerodynamics is huge, especially at fast tracks. So aerodynamics, they run you know different handlebars, different tank, different subframe. You know, I think the only thing that we have on the on our bikes that are similar is our frames and uh, the engines. You know, even but even our engines are quite a bit different because. Our, my engine, you know, is built at the M4 shop and obviously theirs is built at the Yoast shop, but our bikes are completely different. You know, they run a completely different uh, electronics than we do. And like I said, their tank and subframe kind of go together and it's kind of like, you know, one piece. So their bikes definitely uh, put together pretty, pretty mm -hmm. dang nice. But uh, that's the difference in having the factory budget and the M4 budget. But, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about my bike you know like like you guys were saying on the intro if if you're not on a factory team i mean definitely the team hammer bike or is the probably the the most top-notch uh privateer bike you can be on or satellite bike i should say you know i f i feel like i see a lot of uh privateer photos on facebook here lately calling josh heron josh heron's that you know old attack bike a privateer bike so i don't know <laughs> Like uh, annoy anybody by saying satellite and privateer, I guess we need to kind of draw a line where that is. Well, it's definitely a gray area, but you know, it, it's true. And I mean, no disrespect for to Team Hammer or M4 or anything. It's just, it's just, you can definitely tell. And I mean, what you said about the body work and it's kind of cool that it's different. I mean, you guys kind of take a different tack with it and everything, but you, you had mentioned that uh, in the fall, you kind of got back on a 600 again and it used to be pretty interesting with your large, your your taller stature to see you on a six hundred. I mean, you were like a spider monkey on that thing. Now that you're on, now that you're on a <laughs> on a super bike, does the bike feel like it fits you better? Does it still feel a little small? I mean, where are you at with the ergonomics on that bike? I mean, you could still call me a spider monkey on a super bike. I mean, when you're six foot four, you know, it's kind of hard to fit on any street bike. So I'm, you know, definitely. I mean, I am the tallest the tallest guy in the paddock and still look huge on the bike, but you know, I try to stay as little and light as I can. And, uh, I feel like, you know, I'm pretty flexible. And if you're looking at us going down a straightaway, I mean, I feel like I definitely have one of the best tucks as, as I can. And, uh, obviously in the corners, I'm, I'm pretty big, but you know, Schultz, 
to me looks bigger on the bike than I do. So uh, I try to do the best with what I have. But you know, when you have long legs and a long torso like myself, it's kind of hard to look look small on a bike. You know, I'm not Tony size <laughs> or Josh's size or JD size. So I uh, kind of have to deal with what I got. <laughs> I don't even think there's anybody. I don't. I don't think there's anybody on any crew that's taller. No, I wouldn't say. Uh, you know, no. Actually, uh, one of the guys that worked on the ridiculous crew. Uh, his name's Chris Tullock. He talks crap to me all the time about basketball and how he could dunk on me. So that's the only oh, guy so that has might... me in height. But that's it. I mean, Hans is pretty big from Yosh, but right. you know, he's not. <laughs> he, he's 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 no, definitely he, he, bigger. He, like Hans combined weight and, and yeah, height, Hans but... doesn't have me because. Because, uh, you know, I always eat over at the Yosh guys just because, you know, I kind of used to ride with those guys. And I go over to Hans when he's grilling and just walk up to him and bump my chest up against his chest and have him look up at me because I'm proud to be the tallest <laughs> one there. You know, um, <laughs> I yesterday I talked to Janet uh, Nis, Jeanette Nisani for a little bit from Altus Motorsports. And, Jake, you you probably would know this. She said that Miles Thornton is 6'3". Is he that tall? Uh, I don't know if he's 6'3". I mean, he, he might, yeah, he might be, you know, 6'2", 6'3", but, I mean, unless you're taller than me, I don't know how he, tall he He doesn't look are. nearly as tall as Ooh. you, and, and Matthew, I think Matthew's about, Skoltz is about, I think he may be 6'1", but, you know, he's he's a pretty big built guy. I mean, he's, he's there's n not an ounce of fat on that guy, but there's a lot of, a lot of muscle. I mean, you, you, uh, you keep yourself a little narrower, I think, but, yeah, I don't think there's anybody taller for sure. Um, standing by Tony must be interesting when you're over there in the line to get lunch or something. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure, he Tony. Is, I mean, Tony, is Tony probably <laughs> comes up. Yeah, Tony. <laughs> Tony, I don't even honestly don't even think Tony comes up. He doesn't even come up to my Adam's apple, so he is pretty small. And he, and you and you look at the guy's shoes, and his shoes are tiny. So definitely de different sizes. You know, one guy you you could take his shoes and actually hang in from your rearview mirror in your truck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jake, there's one guy on your team that I don't know that very very well, but he's been in the paddock forever and ever. And I have old press kits with team with teams that he worked with. Keith Perry, what's what's he like to work with? Is he pretty quiet? Does he you know does he get in your face too much or how what's it like with him? <laughs> Yeah, you know, Keith, Keith's actually an awesome guy, but uh, like you said, I mean, I don't know if you know him too well or a lot of people don't know him too well just because he is so quiet and uh, he's strictly about business and he's pretty much does everything on the team, you know, all the bikes and everything is built at his shop in Athens, Alabama, and he's in charge of uh, making the most power and building all the engines for the bikes. So uh, he's the man to talk to, you know, when especially when we're testing and he's building a new new engine and trying new things on the superbike engine like because you know this was their first year with the suzuki uh superbike so he was trying new things throughout the year and would ask me advice but you know he's honestly not really too strict on me he's always there you know on our debriefs and seeing how everything's going so you know I, even though he's been around for a while i feel like he still loves to be around the paddock and uh try to try to do the you know try to put the bikes up on the podium and in the winds cool. Hey Jake, I got to talk to you about something here that's it's not easy to talk about. But you lo you lost your father this year, and ha for those of us that that haven't really gone through that, I mean, ha how difficult was that? And then to be to I mean, to your credit, I mean, you were you were you you threw yourself right back into the mix of things, and and you and your mom were at the track, and and I I, I you're probably going to tell us that that was that 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 was the best place for you to be. But how just Tell us a little bit how difficult that whole that whole thing was for you because it I can't even imagine it at this point. Yeah, I mean, for sure, that was definitely one of the – I mean, it is the toughest thing I've ever had to go through because uh, me and my dad have been traveling around the whole U.S., racing ever since I was four years old in a van. So uh, to lose someone like my dad who really loved racing and loved seeing me, you know, do as, as good as I have uh, was a, was a big hit to me. And just, uh, you know, having, having his advice and uh, he would always go out and watch practices, qualifying, race and kind of tell me what I needed to work on. And uh, that was, you know, the main thing, you know, just the motivation to have him there and to make him to, to make him happy. And uh, especially this winter, you know, this winter has been really difficult for me and my mom and my sister and pretty much my whole family because uh, 
racing, you know, kind of kept us close and together. And this winter, you know, it's kind of, you know, winter in Kentucky is pretty much depressing anyways because of the weather, snow, rain, cold. You know, you can't really do much outside. So we're definitely looking forward to the to the season to get started, to have something to do as a family together. And uh, just, I mean, honestly, just the motivation because uh, he would push me so much. You know, I would, when I lived back home, I would, like I said, I'd ride four or five times a day. And if my bike didn't have dirt on it, when he got home, uh, you know, he would give me hell. So uh, definitely it sucks. You know, I did an exp- something, you know, you can't really like – to prepare for and uh just trying to do the best like uh, w- what i can and looking forward to, to i'm sure year. a lot of people have told you this jake and and I, I never have told you this but um he he was like a dad to to all of us in the paddock i mean i would see him every day in the morning or at night or whatever and he'd always say hello he'd always say hey good luck today and i'd exchange the good luck back to him and he just always made a point to be you know to reach out to to everybody and i bet a lot of people told you that in the paddock this year didn't they yeah for sure you know uh because like just like me you know my dad pretty much is down to earth and will talk to pretty much anyone uh so it's kind of you know it was definitely a bummer i feel like around the whole paddock because he pretty much did go to uh every every race with me and you know sacrificed a ton throughout my whole career you know even at one time he was working at a harley davidson shop and they weren't gonna let him take off on the weekend so he quit and went to work at our local uh food giant store cutting meat because you know that's how much he loved to go to the races and be with our racing family so uh luckily you know you know i feel like racing is pretty much a big family for me so that's why i'm kind of really looking forward to getting the season started because like i said uh this winter's definitely been tough as as far as, you know, being the first winter without my dad. So uh, the holidays definitely sucked mm-hmm. and uh, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay, so talk to us about this next year. You've, uh, do you have any testing planned or or you don't get to do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we actually do get to uh, ride twice. Uh, you know, it, that that is one kind of the drawback, you know, not being on a factory team because, I mean, I've seen – you know, I think last week it was all five of the pretty much the top superbike guys were out testing, but uh, you know, my my bike's still not ready, and they're still getting you know everything lined up for the year. But we do get to test, I think, two days at Jennings before Daytona, and then also one more uh, private test. So I'll have, a, I mean, not much time on the bike, but uh, you know, it's better than going to Road Atlanta with absolutely no seat time, but. As far as the motivation goes, I mean, I'm really looking forward to the year and the new changes on our bike and working with the same crew guys as I had last year, I feel like will will be a huge help for me. So uh, definitely looking forward to getting the season started because, I mean, honestly, I feel like there's eight to ten guys in the Superbike class that are going to be very competitive. So uh, going to need to be on my A game and really looking forward to fighting up front. When Dunlop changed to that rear tire uh, as of Road America, and you guys tested it in the at the preseason test, um, and, but some of the riders had it a little bit earlier than that, which, you know, the factory riders, now you say you don't test as much as them. Was it, was the transition in that new tire tough for you, or did you adapt to it okay? Where, where did that stand with you? Yeah, you know, honestly, uh, the big tire didn't really affect, affect my side and uh, my bike at all really uh, obviously we tested it at the barber test the moto america test and we kind of figured out there what what the bike needed to uh to adjust to the tire but you know a lot of the riders and teams complained about that tire and their setup uh, after they changed everything but you know honestly when we went to that tire at road america i had a really good weekend at road america you know i think i was fourth in the first race and maybe fourth or fifth in the second race and through the last half of the season i mean i was consistently always up front so uh didn't affect my speed or my bike really any and uh i don't know i'm kind of looking forward to you know that tire again this year because you kind of already know what it feels like and we'll already have some notes going into this season and uh it'll be interesting you know i think three of the rounds are two-day events and uh, i feel like those those kind of events will help, help us. yeah it didn't seem like your transition it affected you at all it seemed like like we talked in the beginning of the podcast about you being consistent throughout the year but man it seemed like it was a light switch situation for some of the riders i mean you know total tony suddenly struggled um you know it, i i think even even garrett had some issues with that that tire uh but and certainly matthew skoltz did he he just was 
having a terrible time in that second half of the year with that with that tire and uh yeah you were consistent all the way through do you attribute that to are you do you ride the front more are you you know you're a flat tracker so i don't know if you use the rear brake much steer with the rear end where where are you at with your uh what what would you say your riding style is yeah i mean i definitely uh ride, ride the front of the mm -hmm. bike a lot be uh the front end, the front end confidence and feel of what I have, I definitely need that underneath of me. But I mean, I think the tire was five or ten millimeters different. So I mean, it's I, I feel like it wasn't a huge change. And uh, like you said, there was a, definitely a handful of riders that struggled with it a lot. But I feel like some of that was mental for those guys because uh, you know I feel like if they didn't feel exactly like they did with the old tire, you know, they kind of freaked out and then that's all they had stuck in their head. And, you know, once they figured it out, I feel like they kind of got the hang of it. But I mean, when I switch something on the bike or just even in general, I don't really let it affect me. I mean, I'm just going to ride and do the best I can with what I have. And, you know, everyone's on the same stuff. So you can't really complain about right. what you did. So since you do ride the front a little bit, and we talked to Cameron Bobier about this, he really liked that rear tire, but he, he especially liked that new extra soft front Dunlop. Did you like that extra soft new tire on the front? Did that help you? No, uh, not for me, honestly. Uh, we did try it out, and I think at one race I did race with it, but uh, just because, you know, I think Tony tried it, and so did Cameron, and, you know, a couple of the, the very front runners were running it, so we obviously tried it, but maybe with my size and how hard I break up and down and uh, use the front out, I, I would always fold the front and flex the front in. You know, I feel like Cameron uses a lot of roll speed and carries a lot of mid-corner speed, so that tire definitely did help him, but as far as myself, I didn't run that mm, tire. Okay. Did you did you go did you do some off road racing this year? I know you you did some GNCC stuff and, and last year I don't know if you if you did anything this year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's that's one of the things I, I you know I kind of uh, like I said earlier the winter was tough on me like losing my dad throughout half the season so I kind of wanted to keep my mind busy and keep kind of in the racing mode and uh, all all throughout my amateur career and growing up he would always take me to the GNCC and off road races so. I asked JD if he wanted to do a couple of those, and uh, I think I did two or three of them, but the other two I was planning on doing ended up getting rained out or snowed out, so I didn't get to do all of them that I wanted to, but still did quite a bit of woods riding and uh, motocrossing as, as much as I could, and that's always a, a fun time because those dudes, I mean, you don't really realize it until you're racing, but those dudes are completely badass too because, I mean, the races are two or three hours long, and you race in pretty much any condition, rain, mud, snow, rocks, I mean, hopping over logs, doing all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's definitely pretty, pretty fun. And I kind of like to do all sorts of riding just to keep my, keep my motorcycle skills fresh and just always been on a bike. It's funny. I remember there used to be a... Sean, refresh my memory, refresh my memory a little bit, Sean. When we were talking to JD... <laughs> was it Jake Lewis that he said was stuck in the mud, or was it somebody else? I was else? just about this. I think it was. I think it, I think it was Jake Lewis, and, and JD said he had to stop and kind of help him. But then once he, lit, you know, realized that the, the kid was okay, then he could go ahead and keep picking his ass. I think that's how he explained it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely how he explained it. Uh, I do a lot of shit talking to JD too because uh, I'm usually pretty good in the woods and run up front in the A class, so uh, I take pride in being fast in the woods, but. It was on the last lap of the one we did. Uh, heck, I pretty much sunk my bike to the seat, <laughs> and I couldn't get it out, and I was so tired. It was, it was already past two hours. <laughs> yeah. And luckily, uh, here comes Jiggy Dog, and he's like, you need help? I'm like, uh, if you want to, you know, I'll, I'll just sit here and wait for someone to come help me if you don't want to. And, uh, I mean, heck, he was in a race, and luckily had a good friend, and he got off and helped me dig it out <laughs> at least a little bit. And then the other two guys that were clearing out the trail helped me finish it. So. Uh, he ended up did he ended up beating me that race so i wasn't too happy about that but luckily you know we'll be racing together this year and really looking forward to uh, jd moving up to the superbike class i think it'll be exciting yeah how do you think he'll do oh uh, i mean honestly i feel like he'll do pretty pretty good you know obviously he's a heck of a rider but uh like look at garrett you know he pretty much dominated that 600 class the year before and got on the thousand and definitely struggled a little bit compared to what he was mm. used to but i really don't think the people uh in the i don't know i mean obviously the fans know the super class is tough but as a rider i really don't think people 
maybe don't i'm obviously they give us credit but the super bike class is completely stacked and it's really hard you know there's a lot of fast riders in there and uh jd's done you know quite a few tests i mean four or five tests already so i mean i think he'll be ready come rolling around the season but i mean i've seen some people say it's going to be a josh heron and jd beats uh showdown but i mean hell there's cam you know cameron tony josh myself matthew garrett s or not s like but gagne wyman peterson i mean there's a a whole lot of us that are going to be fast so uh i think i think he'll do good though that's going to be fun to watch for sure. Hey, uh, Jake, I wanted to ask you, so we've talked to Kelly Reese a couple of times, who is a team manager for Ridiculous Racing, and he's moved to Owensboro and has a turn track. Have you have you been over to that track? I know the weather hasn't been real conducive to that lately, but are, are you planning to go over or have you been been on his track at all? Uh, I mean, I'll say I'll, pr- I'll proudly hold the track record at the Reese Oh, compound, you do? If that answers your question. <laughs> Uh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, like if if you look on his Facebook, I mean, you can look up Kelly Reese, and he even admits Jake Lewis has the track track record at the Reese <laughs> compound. So uh, I'll proudly say I rode over. There. How does it compare to JD's turn track? Is it similar? Do you like it better? Which one is your favorite? Honestly, I like I do like it a little bit better than JD's. Uh, JD's is fun just because it has some elevation, but it's a little bit more tight. You know. Uh, the Reese's house is it's kind of like more flowing and uh fast and kind of carry your carry your corner speed and run second third gear on a 450 which is a little bit more fun for me but i mean it's it's nice to have now to have two places to ride at you know around town within 20 minutes of my house because uh before you know we only had pretty much jd's to, jd's place to ride out after the hayden's uh kind of shut their track down at their house so it's mm. it's fun I, I I bet you can't say that you proudly hold the lap record at JD's house, though. Ah, uh, you know, we'll argue that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, me honestly, me and JD are about the same speed out there on dirt bikes. We There was only one day uh, after the season ended that we did do lap times, and uh, he beat me by three tenths, and I was pissed off about it just because uh, other people, you know, were doing it on stopwatch. So until we get transponders out there, we won't know who's fastest. <laughs> There you go. The, the other thing we saw with Kelly is, you know, Kelly, I didn't realize how big of a hunter Kelly is from coming from Utah. Now, I'm not saying there isn't hunting in Utah, but it's different from hunting in, in Kentucky. And I know, I know Roger does some of it. Nick does. Do you, do you get involved in any of that, Jake, or do you let them kind of do their thing with that? I let them do their thing with that. You know, I'm not a, a, a big hunter at all. I think I've only went like two or three times in my mm-hmm. life. Uh, Especially that they like deer hunting, which is honestly pretty boring for me. You know, you sit in a stand, have to be quiet, freeze your butt off. And, uh, that's just not my. That's just not up my alley. Yeah, it sounds like a, it sounds worse than going to the dentist. Yeah, it's not much fun. So I let them do all that. All right, guys, um, let's uh, let's call this a show. Uh, Jake, it's been it's been awesome having you on here. We uh, Sean and I talked about having you on here a while mm-hmm. ago, and. We wanted to. Uh, we needed to wait until your announcement was official that you were you were back with the same team with the M4X or Suzuki team. So uh, thanks for joining us, and you know we wish you the best for uh, for this year. I know you're looking forward to getting to the races, and and so are we. And uh, we will see you down the road. Um, Sean, thanks for joining us again. Uh, hopefully you can kind of stay warm. Actually, this morning here when I when I was driving to work, it was like 33 degrees. Oh, so that's it was. Uh, it it was it was downright chilly, but it, it oh, you know the sun warmed us up a little. I know, right? But we we're just happy because <laughs> it wasn't it it wasn't raining because we've had a bit of that lately. So it uh, I think we're gonna have a decent weekend. But thanks to both of you for uh, for joining me and and thanks to the to the listeners for uh, for liking the show and and however you uh, you choose to uh, to get your broad your uh, podcasts uh, keep doing it and uh, they're available on Saturday mornings. And again, thank you both and thank you to the listeners. And we'll do this again next week, Sean. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Uh, Good talking to you, Jake. Uh, See you in a bit. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And we're looking forward to this upcoming Moto America season. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you.